Welcome to our webinar. We're going to give you as comprehensive of an update on FDA pre-market review of commercial tobacco products as we can. That's no easy task, but we're going to do our best. Uh, next slide, please. In case you haven't worked with us before, uh, we're attorneys at the Public Health Law Center. We're based out of the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, which we want to acknowledge is on the historic lands of the Dakota people. This region known as Bedote was the center of all things for the Dakota people. My home where I'm speaking from now is located just a mile or so from the site of the Dakota village of Kaposia, which was relocated here after the Treaty of 1837 forced the Dakota people from their ancestral lands. They were then removed from this area again in 1851 by another treaty with the United States. I appreciate the ongoing stewardship, spiritual connections, and life ways developed in these homelands upon which I occupy. I also acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory and have joined into, com into community here in this region. Next slide, please. Uh, at the Public Health Law Center, all of our work is grounded in and centered on advancing health equity. This means we focus on public health goals that support everyone in our communities by recognizing the systemic barriers and unique obstacles that groups and individuals may face in living healthy lives. We work to encourage communities to advance policies that will provide greater protection to those who have experienced the greatest disparities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> if you haven't worked with us, we would love to help you. We provide a service that we call legal technical assistance which takes a variety of forms. You'll find hundreds of publications on our website. We host trainings and webinars like this one. The bulk of what we do is individualized. So we are funded to answer the legal questions that are often inherent in policy work. The only thing we don't do is lobby. So we don't engage directly with certain policymakers and we don't do direct representation. So we don't go to court on anyone's behalf, but we're happy to help you in any way that we can if you're working on advancing uh, public health policy. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm really excited about today's webinar. We're going to be discussing FDA pre-market review from top to bottom. We'll get, get you up to speed on how we got here today, um, and then we'll discuss what's happening right now in this sort of weird and interesting window in time where we are at the moment. And then we're going to look to the future and identify what happens next, as well as some of the looming uncertainties. So. Uh, you're going to hear from my colleagues, Kira Hill and Mike Marissa, and I will turn it over to Mike right now. Thank you, Desmond. Um, as you can see here on slide six, uh, we'll give you a quick uh, review of the agenda for today. Uh, at the outset, I would like to say that one frustration that most public health groups have had with uh, past FDA action in the space is that too often it's reactive and not proactive in its role of, of protecting the public health. So this webinar will cover FDA's progress on pre-market review as it stands now and as it's developing. Uh, finally, uh, we'll discuss what we think is the future uh, of uh, FDA action in this space, which is the promulgation of public health standards as outlined in the Tobacco Control Act. And then we'll end with a question and answers at the end of this uh, the webinar. Now, slide seven shows the current state of the law, which is no new tobacco product can be sold without marketing authorization from the FDA. This means all e-cigarettes, hookahs, cigarillos, et cetera, all must go through the pre-market review process in order to be commercially marketed in the US. But a trip to your, your uh, gas station or tobacco shop proves that there are new tobacco products uh, and seemingly new ones every day. And that gives us, brings us to the, to the astonishing fact that no new tobacco products currently on the market has received FDA authorization. What this means is that the FDA has delayed enforcement of the pre-market review process for the last 13 years. And, and counting actually, because uh, right now things exist uh, are under this theory that the FDA has called uh, exercising its 
enforcement discretion. Slide eight uh, shows us that the FDA in fact has abdicated its gatekeeping role. And we can just deduct from that, deduce from that, that has affected the lives of countless number of people. Now in 2018, um, public health groups, uh, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, sued the FDA and obtained a court order that directed the FDA to require manufacturers to submit marketing application and requiring the agency to finally implement a pre-market review process uh, and to do that by September 9, 2020. For uh, reasons that will become clear later, that deadline came and went and there's still no pre-market review enforcement process. Now, Congress passed the Tobacco Control Act to empower, encourage uh, the FDA to make rules and regulation, quote, appropriate for the protection of public health. Now, the, the law only required three, uh, the FDA to take three, um, three prongs. Number one, that the action that the FDA was going to take would have would have population-wide risk and benefits. That it would take into account the likelihood of cessation by tobacco users and the likelihood of initiation by tobacco users. Again, the story is the same in this in the public health standard arena as it is in uh, the pre-market review process. The FDA simply has not acted. I'll now pass the baton to my colleague, Kira, to uh, uh, tell you the rest of the, to delve further into the, into the rest of the process. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Um, so as Mike said, um, the role of FDA in pre-market review is supposed to be one of, of a gatekeeper, but we all know that FDA has not served as an effective gatekeeper and we can see that just by looking at the data. So even though generally speaking, cigarette use declined over the past 20 years, this clearly hasn't been the case for e-cigarettes. We saw skyrocketing use among young people. And we know that that was fueled in large part by Juul. So starting in late 2017, e-cigarette use shot up significantly. On this chart, um, you can see the red represents Juul's market share and the blue represents the market total. So really, Popularity was fueled by the popularity of, of Juul. Um, and just note that this, this doesn't include online sales. This is just in, in store retail sales. Um, but to get a sense of how much of a role the FDA could have ha had in preventing that from happening, let's take a look at some significant, event, significant events that are overlaid on that graph that I just showed. So for example, the deeming rule, which gave the FDA authority to regulate e-cigarettes took effect in August of 2017 sorry, August of 2016. So right after that point, FDA could have required e-cigarettes to come off the market pending regulatory authorization, which is how the Tobacco Control Act is really structured and worded, but the FDA didn't do that. And even as the use rates were skyrocketing, FDA's enforcement efforts were half-hearted at best. So let's just keep this in mind as we talk about FDA's role um, and authority versus what has actually occurred. So here are three timelines that are worth keeping in the back of our minds. Um, the first timeline is one that was envisioned by the deeming rule itself. And if we were operating under that alternate reality, right now we wouldn't have products on the market that hadn't received affirmative marketing orders. Um, the second timeline is a plan that was announced in 2017 by the FDA. And it basically pushed all deadlines um, out and then uh, indefinitely extended the time um, uh, by which only products should, should have been on the market that received affirmative marketing orders. So um, if we were still operating under that alternate reality, we wouldn't even see applications um, having been submitted by this point. But the, oops, sorry, the version that we're actually operating under now is that third timeline. So the third one is the, the timeline that was established by the judge 
as a result of that lawsuit that Mike talked about, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics and other public health groups sued the FDA in order to require it to comply with the pre-market review requirements of the Tobacco Control Act. So this is the timeline that matters now. Um, and this is the timeline that established that September 9th, 2020 date for pre-market review application submissions. And then the September 9th, 2021 date after which the only products that are supposed to be on the market are those that receive affirmative, affirmative marketing orders from the FDA. So now that we're a little way, ways, or a little past the halfway mark during that one year period, um, let's take a look at where we are and what we know um, about how that process is unfolding. So on February 16th of 2021, just a couple of months ago, the head of the Center for Tobacco Products, Mitch, Mitch Zeller, issued a perspective piece that was intended to provide an update on the progress the agency has made on processing or, and reviewing applications. Um, this is really all we know about the progress of the pre-market review process because the process is not public. The public does not have access to company marketing applications. So our starting point is just like yours, one with pretty limited access to information. And I think that the first question on a lot of people's minds is how many products we're talking about. Technically, there are three marketing pathways available for new products, and they include substantial equivalence, substantial equivalence exemption, and pre-market tobacco product application, or PMTA. So the substantial equivalence process is one that applies to products that are effectively the same as products that were on the market as of February 15, 2007. So we're, we're really focusing on the PMTA process. That's the one that applies to the vast majority of products. And as you can see from the graphic on this slide, which is um, from the FDA, there are a lot of products. So as of January 2021, you're reading that correctly, the FDA had processed applications for 4.8 million products for the PMTA pathway. But note that processed is kind of a misleading word here because these products haven't even begun the formal review process, with, which starts with acceptance. So this graphic is taken partly from the FDA um, perspective piece, but I've added a phase zero to this to indicate where the agency is with respect to most products at the moment. So in a, it's you know, processed 4.8 million products, but it hasn't moved to the acceptance phase for most of them. This is another FDA graphic. The acceptance phase is slow going with only 84,000 products having been accepted for formal review out of the 4.8 million PMTAs that the agency has received. So why, why is this happening so slowly? Um, according to the agency, there really wasn't a uniform method of submitting applications. So the applications varied widely in terms of their organization, the number of products that were addressed. In fact, one firm apparently submitted an application that covered 4 million products, um, which is itself a little confusing because we don't know if that was one firm it was like a consulting firm submitting on behalf of a number of companies or whether it was just one company, it's kind of hard to know. Um, so uh, th th this is really based on the limited information we have at this point. So like you, we're really interested in figuring out which products shouldn't be on the shelves, meaning which products didn't submit applications. The FDA is apparently working on developing a list of those products that have submitted applications, but so far it's been unable to compile a list of products that have submitted PMTAs due to that complexity and volume of the applications that, that I just talked about. Um, one significant impediment appears to be that the FDA did not require information about the dates of marketing or the marketing status of individual products in the applications. So now the FDA is going back and contacting applicants to verify that information. So the FDA has publicly stated that it intends to provide a list to the public, but it has not yet done so. So just to recap, with respect to the vast majority of products, we're still at this kind of base, phase zero of the review process. Um, apparently the agency has started substantive review of hundreds of products, but when that happens, the only entity notified is the applicant itself. So the public has no way of knowing which products are undergoing substantive review. Um, and of course that process is gonna be extremely complex and time consuming because it involves the review of all of the um, pharmacological and toxicological and behavioral studies and everything. 
So what does this mean for the implementation of, of the timeline that um, I talked about earlier? So the products that haven't submitted applications aren't supposed to be on the shelves right now. But because there's no way to know which products do and do not have applications pending, it's impossible to know which ones shouldn't be sold. That said, there are a couple ways of knowing which products are a priority for FDA enforcement. The first is, a, is the enforcement priorities guidance that the FDA re released in January of 2020 and was revised again in April of 2020. And as you may remember, um, that document indicated that FDA intends to enforce against cartridge and pod-based e-cigarettes that come in flavors other than tobacco and menthol. Just to review, um, that not surprisingly resulted in increasing popularity of the products that were allowed to remain on the shelves. So menthol, tobacco flavored products, along with some other products I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, and it really ended up looking like more of a game of whack of mole than effective enforcement. So as for actual enforcement efforts, the FDA does maintain a list on their website of warning letters that they've sent to manufacturers. The list includes letters sent almost exclusively to e-liquid manufacturers of flavors that are clearly intended to appeal to young people. And I've reviewed a lot of those letters. Um, here's, here's one example. Um, this is a letter to a company called Kidney Puncher LLC, which manufactures and sells e-liquid products, including Rockstar Breakfast, KP Blue Brew, Blue Brew and potion seller Crimson Monk. The manufacturers um, to whom the FDA has sent enforcement letters so far range in size from having a few hundred products registered to over 100,000 products registered with the FDA. So the warning letter list is really the only list that's available um, of products that haven't submitted applications with the FDA. Um, but Let's just keep in mind that this is kind of a, this is the low hanging fruit of enforcement efforts because these are companies that have literally registered products with the FDA, um, but then failed to file marketing applications by the deadline. And then other companies have kind of simply just changed their business practices to evade FDA's regulatory authority. Most notably, the company Puff Bar recently announced that it no longer uses tobacco derived nicotine for its products. Um, why does this matter? Well. FDA's enforcement authority only applies to tobacco-derived nicotine. Um, so either way, the FDA should definitely attempt to verify this. Um, even, even if it does, it will take a bit of time to determine um, during which point, you know, Puffbar is probably going to continue selling its products. Um, and then since you're probably wondering, it will take an act of Congress to put syn synthetic non-tobacco-derived nicotine within purview of the Center for Tobacco Products. Um, given that the Tobacco Control Act applies to tobacco-derived products, it is possible that the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research could regulate these products. Um, that's kind of a little, a little bit more nuanced than we have time to get into right now, but if you want more information about that, you can check out an article um, available on our website that one of our colleagues, Natalie Hummerk, wrote, um, along with some other researchers, and we also have a poster available on our website that Stephanie will um, drop in the chat too, if you wanted to check that out. So other products that have been left behind in FDA's enforcement efforts um, are little flavored cigars. So initially FDA had actually indicated it planned to prioritize enforcement of pre-market review requirements against little cigars, but the final version of the guidance backpedaled on that commitment and we're not seeing prioritization of those products either. So what does this mean for what happens over the next six months of the review process? So the FDA stated in its perspective piece that given the unprecedented number of applications, the likelihood of reviewing all the applications by September 9th, 2021 is low. So it pretty much means it's not gonna happen. Um, what, what does that mean and what, what'll happen in the meantime? So products whose applications move through the acceptance and filing phases will start undergoing scientific review, the substantive scientific review. So this means using that public health standard that Mike introduced earlier to assess whether a product's marketing is appropriate for the protection of the public health. Um, 
And again, this requires taking into account risks and benefits to the population as a whole, likelihood of cessation by existing users, and likelihood of initiation by non-users. But again, because there, this is really just the statutory language and there are no clear guide rails, there's no guidance on how this is gonna be applied, we don't have a clear sense of how that review is going to occur. And of course, what types of impacts and risks and to whom the, the agency is going to analyze. So there has been some pressure from members of Congress um, in relation to this lack of gu guide rails that exists with the public health standard. On January 13th of this year, 2021, 12 senators sent a letter to then Commissioner Hahn setting forth a list of principles for the FDA to consider in reviewing products. And those principles included um, the ones listed on this slide and generally suggest employing a precautionary approach to any product approvals. And that makes sense. Any product approval has to be appropriate for the protection of the public health, which at the end of the day should mean the products are gonna help people who use tobacco products and not harm people who don't with a particular focus on the communities that have been left behind and making sure that the products are appropriate for the protection of the public health. Um, the, the senators suggest that flavored products, products with high levels of nicotine, products that will lead to multi-product use, products that will be used by people who don't already smoke, and products that are gonna harm communities already disproportionately harmed by commercial tobacco should just be outright rejected. And to me, this seems like a sensible application of a standard that is really supposed to be a high bar, or at least requirements that would result in authorization of the fewest products possible. But what those of us in the public health community would like to see happen and what is likely to happen are probably different from one another. So ideally we'd like to see few, if any product authorizations. What we're likely to see are some product authorizations for products that shouldn't be authorized. We'd also like to see products come off the shelves after September 9th of 2021. What we're likely to see is a request to the court in Maryland for an extension of time to review applications and then continue deferred enforcement. But um, figuring out exactly what's gonna happen in, in the lawsuit in the um, District of Maryland is a little bit like reading tea leaves. So while there's pretty much a guarantee the FDA is gonna request more time, there's certainly no guarantee that, the, that more time is going to be granted. So I don't wanna leave everyone with um, kind of a sense of gloom and doom. So um, I do wanna highlight some state and local efforts to serve, um, to serve that gatekeeping role that FDA has not served. So first of all, there are a few jurisdictions that have enacted their own restrictions on products that do not have affirmative marketing orders from the FDA. The letter depicted on this slide um, is an example from San Francisco, which is one jurisdiction that enacted that kind of restriction. Um, other jurisdictions have gone further with places like Beverly Hills and Manhattan Beach enacting their own full tobacco product sales restrictions with growing interest from other communities. And then of course, states like Massachusetts and California enacted their own statewide flavored tobacco product sales restrictions. Um, although California's is currently on hold due to tobacco industry interference. And then there are also some creative local efforts to use federal legal requirements in novel ways that I really wanna highlight. So um, the LA city attorney, for example, um, has successfully brought claims against e-cigarette companies under California's unfair competition law, arguing among other things that selling products without having gone through pre-market review constitutes an unlawful business practice. Um, the LA City Attorney actually announced just yesterday a $1.2 million penalty and an injunction against the company Candy Pens Inc, um, preventing it from targeting youth and its, in, in its marketing campaigns. So I find this really interesting because the California unfair competition law empowers the attorney general, district attorneys, and some city attorneys um, to enforce the law. And there are other states that are gonna have various iterations of unfair competition laws as well that might lead themselves well to similar arguments and using sort of creative legal theories. Um, I wanna draw attention to the warning letters that I talked about earlier, because those are really the, 
best information we have right now about which companies haven't submitted applications. So using the warning letters um, might be one place to start. Um, if you know of products that are out there in your jurisdiction um, and you happen to have a, a role that bringing claims like this or is within the scope of your of your work, um, it might be something worth checking out. And then um, last but not least, I can't leave EarthWeed personally without talking about the environmental impacts of new products. So part of the PMTA pro process actually requires companies to submit what are called environmental assessments under the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. So Unfortunately, FDA, just like the rest of the applications, does not make these doc documents public during the review phase. Um, this is problematic in, in, in and of itself in my mind, but it's also especially problematic because these documents are more than just a paper exercise because e-cigarettes contain nicotine, which is an acute hazardous waste. And they also contain certain types of batteries, which are often also classified as hazardous waste. So, the environmental assessments really should be analyzing the potential environmental consequences of marketing and disposing of these products in ways that lead to additional waste accumulation and environmental and public health harms. Um, so that's just something that I wanted to add about how the process is going and so sometimes is, um, is not uh, highlighted in, in that kind of PMTA process. Um, so with that, um, I know that was a lot and a quick, quick rundown of a lot of information. Um, if you have any further questions, we're gonna have a Q&A right now. As Stephanie said, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, that's my email, our um, other contact information and feel free to reach out to any of us with follow-up questions, but we'll take as many as we can right now. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right. uh, if you have questions, start throwing them in the Q&A panel. That's a little bit easier than the uh, chat. We can keep track of questions and what we've answered, what we haven't. Um, there was something early on in the chat that I think we did get to, Kira, but maybe you want to talk a little bit more about what can be done at the state and local level? Um, I think you sort of gave two good options. There are communities have, that have thought about sort of hooking their own local regulation to FDA regulation like San Francisco. And then we have the, the lawsuits as well about unfair business practices. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to, to say about those, people were sort of looking for that information and then you got to it. But if there was any parts that you wanted to unpack, there just about efforts by local yeah i mean i think yeah. the gist of the question was that you know people are sort of tired for the fda not doing its job so if if we're we're not going to bother trying to push them further and we have you know there's litigation that's doing that so what what else can we do with our local governments that have the authority to to do something mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the San Francisco example and places like Richmond, California have also um, kind of tied sales restrictions to products that haven't received affirmative marketing authorizations. Um, there's some role for that, for that approach, um, especially maybe if in a jurisdiction that doesn't have as much political support for long-term restrictions. Um, the problem with it though, is that it, it's gonna result in kind of the jurisdiction giving up um, some authority to the PMCA process. And so if there's a, a product, for example, that doesn't meet the statutory standard, maybe there's some ongoing litigation about it, um, the, the local jurisdiction in, in, it, in any other circumstance would have the authority to just restrict the sale of, of the product for public health reasons. If it ties it to the PMTA process, it is giving up some of that authority. So. That's why I, I tried to highlight the other efforts by, by places to just enact flavored product sales restrictions, for example, um, because it, it accomplishes the same thing. So the question really needs to be, what's the goal um, that, that you have in your jurisdiction? Is it getting products off the shelves? If so, then you probably don't need to tie it to the federal process. Um, if it has something, if it's something else, then 
you know, maybe, maybe in your jurisdiction that makes more sense for other reasons. But um, yeah, I, I think in terms of actual, you know, um, uh, ordinances, though, those, those are kind of the examples that I, that I could think of. Um, I, I really liked the effort by the LA city attorney clearly um, to kind of just use some, some interesting um, legal theories to, to address the failure of, of products to just comply with the law. And, and, and again, like we're just talking about a process that exists in law. <laughs> we're not, it's not like a crazy request to ask companies to just comply with the law, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, this is an interesting question and I'll just, I'll just throw it out there and, and see what you wanna think of it. But um, the question is why? Why is the FDA so far behind when it comes to, to pre-market review? Which is a really good question. And I don't know if there's a, an actually good answer, but either of you wanna take a stab at it? Maybe you have thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, I thought I would offer it to you first if you felt like weighing in, but I mean, there, well, is there anything you would like to say about it before I say what I have to say? Um, I mean, my my sense is certainly that you know there have been a lot of applications, and I have no doubt that there are certain entities that decided to throw a lot of applications for every possible thing they could possibly they could think of, um, and in maybe a way that was not anticipated anticipated by the agency. Um, based on the framing of that perspective piece, it's sort of can confusing to me that there wasn't like more of a standard um, process by which or format even like of applications like it doesn't make sense to me that some are formatted completely differently and there are different versions and copies that have been received and some talk about one product some talk about millions of products it just that to me um, doesn't doesn't make sense and it seems like maybe there are some organizational issues um, there and certainly we've heard from the agency that you know, well, I I'm not gonna try to posit um, what what was going on in the heads of people, but um, yeah, I, I I mean it just it seems like there was kind of an organizational uh, kerfuffle. <laughs> so maybe I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that though. Yeah, I mean, I mean we've been getting this question a lot for for years really because this has been there's been this like this process has been looming for, for a long time, um, even before the, the deeming rule, which is the, the thing that actually gets the FDA to be able to do pre-market review for e-cigarettes and, and cigars and other products. And I mean, if you go, if you go back to the very beginning of, of FDA tobacco regulation, I would say that the FDA's track record with implementing an effective process is, is bad. Right, like if I was gonna score it on a scale of one to ten, it's it's in the below five for sure. I'd have to really think about what score I would want to give it. But um, you know, there there are process problems from from day one, and I think the the roots of that are a small agency at the beginning that was trying to figure out what it was even doing at the same time it was having to deal with pre-market review of products that are, you know, there were probably similar growing pains when FDA suddenly had the authority to regulate drugs. I mean, it was a long time ago, but we've had pre-market review of drugs long enough that sort of, we at least get it and all the big players are willing to participate and, and do what they need to do. You know, we have numerous vaccines for a disease that did not exist a couple of years ago. And it's, uh, it, it, everything went through the process. It at least worked the way that it's supposed to. In tobacco products, you have products that are inherently dangerous and deadly, and the FDA uses a very different standard to decide what should and shouldn't be on the market. But there is little to no incentive for manufacturers to participate in the process in good faith because they make money based on their products being available. So any amount of unavailability based on government regulation is bad for business. And so companies that have been known to violate racketeering laws, are they're not gonna file applications in the way 
that is going to be the most effective for FDA regulation. They're going to do whatever they can to draw the process out as long as it's possible. And, you know, that that has been going on for a while. And then you have the FDA taking over on, on e-cigarettes and then, you know, a, a past administration that is now gone taking over being very business friendly and very anti-regulation. And that's the, the timeline that, that Kira put up earlier. You have the FDA kicking out the deadline for, for e-cigarette review so far into the future that it, I mean, at the time it was just inconceivable. And, you know, that was a, that was an industry protective measure and everything that's happening now, the FDA had anticipated doing this in 2018. So this lack of preparedness is, is mind boggling to me because there are maybe more products out there now than there were in 2018, but not, you know, factors of 10 more. So the FDA should have been, should have been ready for this. It was, it was all prepared to do this in 2018. We're further down the road. If anything, should be more prepared. Um, you know, obviously there are some process rules that probably should have been in place, but I don't know that that is, I don't think that would have made drastic differences in, in where we are now. So um, that was a longer answer than it should have been, but they're, they're just, there has never been, they've never been in a good place. And there are a variety of reasons for that. And not all of them are the FDA's fault. A lot of it is red tape that exists within the federal government outside of FDA at HHS, at the white house, et cetera. Um, but an un, an unwilling industry or an, an industry unwilling to participate in good faith is also a, a huge part of it. There's just no incentive to, to play by the rules. And that gets to um, some of the enforcement issues that you were talking about as well, Kira. If you don't have, if your regulatory agency doesn't have, you know, a stick, then there is no carrot here at all. So if it doesn't use the stick, nothing happens, right? Um, that took up more time than I probably should have, but let's, uh, there's a couple of questions that I saw um, that I want to sort of all bring together um, and to talk uh, just for a minute about um, the intersection of like FDA, EPA regulations, NEPA, um, you know, so the NEPA review of products and also like e-cigarette waste. Four minutes on that, Kira. Okay. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> um, well, I'll preface that by just saying um, we do have some, um, we have a page on tobacco product pollution. Um, I do want to call out the fact that combustible cigarettes are a huge environmental issue. I'm not um, trying to minimize the environmental issue of, of uh, cigarette butts and filters that are made of plastic and, um, you know, degrade into tiny little micro plastics. We have a lot of information about that on our website. Um, I know Truth Initiative also just came out with um, some helpful infographics and a, and a report. Um, and I'm really glad that this is becoming more um, of a widely understood issue. Um, in terms of sort of the regulatory authority, there, um, I'm hoping we will be able to, we, we do have some webinars on this um, kind of, especially disposal of products by places like schools. Um, we have a fact sheet on that. So if you're interested in that issue, um, definitely take a look. EPA does absolutely have authority over um, disposal of, hazard, of acute hazardous waste and hazardous waste in general. Um, there, there's a lot of kind of nuance in terms of like how much an entity has of, of a product um, and then how it's treated by, uh, by EPA. Um, so I am happy to follow up with folks on kind of like the more complicated aspects of that. Um, but in general, I mean, they, um, these products are, are, should be handled carefully. They should be, um, if they're being confiscated in places like schools or airports um, or even courthouses, they need to be stored um, properly in a way that isn't going to increase likelihood of explosion or fire. Um, they need to be disposed of um, in the right way. And two, um, I think someone asked about kind of the, the NEPA process and pre-market review. Um, so in 2015, the, the 
FDA did actually go through with a rulemaking that dealt with NEPA, but the categorical exclusion, categorical exclusion that that person was, that mentioned um, does not apply to the products that we're talking about. They're, it doesn't apply to pre-market review. Um, it, it applied to a very specific subset of products. And so all the products that are going through a pre-market review do have to, to submit environmental assessments. Um, and again, you know, ideally in most processes, those would be available um, for public comment. And it's, it's unfortunate um, and problematic that it's not, that, that, that they aren't. Um, but, you know, I, I think that some of this is, is hopefully becoming, as I said, more, more widely understood and more widely known so people can kind of start to draw more attention to their concerns about, about that. So um, happy to talk more offline with those folks who asked questions about the environmental issues, but I'll kind of leave it at that. It was an amazingly succinct answer to something that we could devote out literal hours too. Um, I will say we're definitely getting a lot more questions in the last year or two on disposal. You know, tons of schools are confiscating them from kids, and then all of a sudden your school is a hazardous waste repository. How do you handle that situation? Um, so yeah, like like you said, we do have resources on our website about that. Uh, we have we've done a couple of webinars on some of the environmental issues, and I am about 99% sure that we'll be doing some more. Particularly, we have been getting questions about um, FDA NEPA review as it relates to um, marketing authorization. So there's a lot to be said about that as well. But that's it for today. Hopefully, um, people got the information they were looking for. Um, plenty more to talk about when it comes to FDA regulation this year, I'm sure. But um, we'll end there today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks.